Shemai Achoi Soiskos, Podlediad Consortium Knobat the Day. And a Podlediad Hun by the Hinkloward, a Trouble Day Third Duidara and Bob Math or Bethe Arisk. Hello and welcome to SCOS, the Central South Consortium podcast. In this podcast, we'll bring you the very latest discussions on all things education. Well, we're really pleased to be able to welcome our innovation schools. Uh, we've got four representatives here from the four innovation schools that uh, that are within the Central South Consortium region. So here, I'm going to go in order of, of my team screen. So we've got Laura Taylor, head teacher of St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Primary School in Penarth. We've got Diane Stone, who's head teacher of T. Gwynne Special School. We've got Yvonne Roberts-Ablett from uh, assistant head teacher in Fitzalan High School. And we've got Beverly Timothy Weber, who's assistant head teacher in Bishop Headley High School. So what we'd like to do since January 2020, when the final framework and guidance was published, we've, of course, um, hit a pandemic and but we are still on track for Crooken for Wales being enacted in 2022. So uh, to pick up from where we left off in terms of part one, we we really honed in on on what what your roles were as innovation schools, but then specifically about how you developed vision at whole school, at AOLE level, and then right across your cluster with the collaborations that you've you've been part of so far. Um, It'd be really great now to look a little bit more at that, maybe that cluster approach, but certainly looking at learning design, curriculum design across the three to 16 continuum and how you've approached that and what your next steps might be. Um, I remember Bev a couple of years ago, having a conversation with you at um, one of the the sort of curriculum events and you were saying how you were considering in Bishop Headley you know what your structures might look like in terms of curriculum and even back then two years ago you were starting to consider that actually we of course know that this is a 3 to 16 curriculum so it should be that all learners are exposed to all areas of learning and experience up to the age of 16 yet of course there's a learning pathway there with our current qualifications and you were questioning back then at a point that I hadn't really considered it in depth well okay so if our learners don't opt to take a an expressive arts GCSE how do we ensure that they still have exposure to learning within and across expressive arts and you know some of those conversations are around how do we timetable that but I felt that in itself was really innovative because that that's a looking right ahead from the bottom up that end point how do we keep breadth you've talked about knowledge really mattering be, being important for you and Bishop Headley and, and it is for everybody it's a balance isn't it with knowledge skills and experiences but making sure that breadth was there is that something that you worked on further with with your team um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your, your discussions around that? Um, I think uh, professional learning is absolutely fundamental in order to make sure that the curriculum is enacted. We've got to think now, what is the acid test? What is the ultimate test on whether your curriculum is successful? And it's that idea that the most disadvantaged, the the, the most um, challenged with, with respect to learning, that they get the chance to gain the power of the powerful. And that can only come if we are giving them a wide range, a breadth of experiences. So it's that idea of what pedagogy, what learning strategies and techniques can we use within the classroom in order to to make sure that that pupil is developed holistically. It's not just they became fantastic scientists or they become brilliant um, literary writers it's about that idea that we, we it's, it's going very much back to um when we're looking at those core skills that they need and it is thinking about making sure that we have our mandatory skills are very much embedded within the curriculum they're not an add-on it isn't something that okay then we'll do a little bit of this today because it's part of our curriculum it has to be embedded in the culture and the ethos of the school and that is is difficult to start off. But if you start thinking about what it is I need, so it's thinking strategic, strategically, but also going into the granular of what does a programme of study look like? Where can authentic links be made across the curriculum? So it's that idea of the, the, the idea of oracy. 
So how can that be enacted within a science classroom? And it's that fundamental um, professional learning that enables our practitioners uh, as highly trusted professionals to be able to get that for their children. And, and, and that comes down to um, if this curriculum is going to be really, really successful, is that we have to trust our practitioners. But in order to, to, to be able to have very highly um, regarded professionals, we need to make sure that the professional learning is right. And that goes into looking at how do we carry out inquiry and, 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 and not just um, making it very much, you know, quantitative, qualitative um, analysis. It's that idea of getting them to, to trust their hunches, for them to trust that they know their pupils the best that they are the people that can really make a difference and diagnose those problems and treat them efficiently. And, and that's that's why we've, we've kind of changed our, um, we don't call it um, uh, professional development, because that's the idea that, do you really want to go to a doctor that's developing? It's that idea that we're doing continual professional learning, that we uh, need to be invested in as much as our pupils because they are only going to have the experience that they are practitioners can actually give them and we can do that as, as a sort of a, a strategic team in order to do that and that's our idea of building capacity within the system yeah. so we've kind of taken it from yes we've got the strategic part this is what SLT's vision is this is how the vision then translates in, in, into middle leaders. And this is then what it looks like for the practitioner in the classroom. But it's also that idea of, well, how do we make sure that our middle leaders are going to be the best middle leaders that they possibly can be? And, and, and that's that idea then of giving that, that autonomy for them to choose what is right for our pupils, for them to be the subject expert. And it's also that idea that we, we, we've, we've actually gone down and, and this is a choice that we are not going to go down AOLEs as being a line management um, system. And, and I think that has to be a choice that has to be made by teachers um, and organisations that's best for them. Because we wanted everybody to feel valued mm -hmm. and we didn't want there to be any sort of hierarchical um, system coming apart. We wanted it to be that French has as much to, to, to give to our pupils education as history, as geography. It's part and parcel of, of the journey towards the four core purposes. And that's our idea of that we've, we've used that idea of how do we use drama within the curriculum in order for to, to promote that oracy how do we use music in re in order to get that and an and imagery uh, of um uh, of, of of powerful pictures so to build that cultural capital and how does that link to what the pupils are bringing in so it's that idea that that we're looking towards our polish families to to our um but filipino families what what, what what can they bring that enriches um our pupils and that comes by that idea of having that strategic and granular um, thinking. And to help that granular thinking and take that cognitive load down for our teachers, we've actually sat down with a curriculum design team so that we know that the, that, that the vision and the terminology and the knowledge going across our system is, is, is sufficient enough in order to enact the curriculum. So we've actually designed how to do um, a programme of study. And it doesn't start with thinking about what activities you do in every lesson. It goes back down thinking of why are you doing this particular programme of study? What is it going to give to your pupils? What skills? And that and that's, can be disciplinary. It can be more holistic, the soft skills. What is that actually going to bring to your pupils? And then also thinking of things like, um, because at the moment we're a secondary school, but thinking of that prior knowledge, the prerequisites that people need to know in order to be successful, but also challenging our uh, subject leaders to turn and say, when is that going to be revisited again? How does that link with the rest of um, your curriculum? How does it link with the school curriculum? 
Thanks, Beth. That's really interesting on a number of levels. Something I really want to unpick there is the professional learning. And I'd like to just unpick a little bit about the schools as learning organisations framework, because a lot of what you were talking about there, the continuous professional learning opportunities, talk directly to some of the dimensions within the slow framework. Um, but I think what, what what you're saying there, there's there's no question these things don't happen um and gumrag happen than wine. It's it's not happening by chance. You are having to very carefully, strategically plan to you're planning for agency autonomy you're planning for those things to be able to happen for there to be continued breadth and and for there to be links right across your curriculum as you just articulated um i know that also subject and discipline um, expertise is really important to you as well but i think what we need to look at is the continuum and what you're saying about prior learning being really key and what we're trying to look at is is these learning models that build from the earlier stage right up as opposed to being a backwards design from a specification from a qualification and to do that of course you know I know Bev, Yvonne, myself we're, we're secondary trained teachers and so we didn't really have exposure in PGC about child development, not really anything much about cognitive science, but we can't possibly start a curriculum design at year seven, can we? Because we've got to pick it up. We've got to be designing right through. So I'd be really interested to know from you how you're working as a three to 16 continuum, if that's something that is yet to develop across your schools or as part of your innovation work, if that's something that's already featured. Um, don't know who'd like to talk about that first, really, but that three to 16 to make sure that, as you said, you're you're sequencing what it is that, that, that your learners are going to know, experience and do. Um, because the framework doesn't do that necessarily for us. It gives us the concepts, the big ideas that, that we need to be considering. But it is about us then saying, OK, in what order, as you said, Bev, do we introduce this? Do we revisit it? Do we consolidate it? Um, so has anybody got any experience of having embarked on that process on a three to 16 or 19 scale? Diane, yes. Um, I was just uh, the reason I enjoyed all the all the things we did with pioneers is it is amazing listening to people from very different backgrounds and looking at people in comprehensive schools and it's we've got the same principles, haven't we, in design? And just listening to you then, Bev, you know, when you were saying that you needed to make all these areas meaningful for your students and. So it doesn't really matter the ability of the children. The same, the principles are completely the same, aren't they? In those basic skills and um, making it all so meaningful. But I think from the age of um, three, when the children are coming in, or, or prior to that, I think when we talk about holistic curriculum, you you just can't do that without parents uh, and that understanding of where those children are coming from. Um, and when we talk about children like ours with um, profound learning needs, I mean the whole of the curriculum has got to be twenty four hour curriculum to be meaningful so lots of work I think needs to be done with parents in partnership as well that they are learning um, and and through lockdown now probably all the schools did when we talk you know we did lots of things with parents on what communication means and what to look out for eye movements or you know when they're at home and they haven't got um, the, all the devices they've got in school but I think it's parents trying to get parents part of the school so they know the basic skills and even manners and health and well-being and sort of emotional and social development, all the things we've done with trauma-informed schools, that's just got to be central from, from a very young age. And um, with us, we do um, a multi-sensory curriculum, also the Roots for Learning, which are just the beginning steps, aren't they, from of development for all children. So, um, and then it, it actually is making that very individual. So if those children need speech and language therapy or physio, that's very much part of our curriculum. Um, when we look at the different areas of curriculum and um, I, I just think no matter where the children's starting point is, um, and particularly from ours, from birth, I suppose, developmentally, um, the starting point is their home, isn't it? And where they are to, and where they are. And then those experiences are, um, the experiences perhaps they're missing or the experiences that mean something for the children as a starting point for their engagement. And I um, and then the curriculum is making it very experiential, isn't it? And interesting and building those skills from an individual point of view. So um, from our point of view, I think um, that's where it would start when the children come into school. 
And I love it. It's from the moment they're born. It, you know, we, we're in the game of educating a whole human being here and that we've got this shared responsibility from that three year old right through. And if you're fortunate enough to be in a through school, you really live and breathe that. And, you know, that's a really special thing that you look at that nursery class and think, wow, I'm going to help you every step along. And I'm going to be with you till you're 16 or, or, or further. But actually, yeah, that home environment and that that we we are educating the whole child which means they they lived experience their home and what we haven't got to yet that I'm really keen to look at is of course the COVID lens of what how has COVID maybe impacted on your vision upon how you're looking at that continuum but of course then when we consider over this last year something that many head teachers senior leaders talk about is that gosh, they know their families so much more now. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, parents who are now expert teachers. We'll have to be awarding QTS to them all. Um, and, you know, that, that that's, that's really helpful, isn't it, in that you've been invited into, a parent, into your family's homes through the kitchen tables, through the screen. So now that has a different dimension for how you're educating them. Um, Laura, I know you were going to come in then, and it may be looking at again that three to 16 and we'll come back to just discussing the the, the COVID aspects of, of all this then after that. Uh, yes I, I was just reflecting then on um, the um, exciting opportunity but also the challenge of um, developing that continuum uh, across three to 16 partly because um, pupils in our schools don't necessarily all go to the same um, high school um, and also um, high schools accept children from uh, a variety of schools and, and so um, maybe my reflection was really um, about how important the concepts of the curriculum are um, you know and, and, and um, our, the um, designing our curriculum guidance gives um, very broad concepts of things that that should be um, explored within um, uh, within classes, for example, um, in in humanities, I'm thinking of things like democracy. Uh, and so, if that if that concept is revisited, uh, uh, and you can see a sort of thread of learning through that concept, knowledge, skills, and experiences, um, it, as such, the the topic that's chosen, um, it, it can be important to the school context. Um, but can be revisited again at a different at a different level because the, the children will develop in more sophisticated skills, a deepening of knowledge. And so um, it's I think that, that there's that important conversation to have within a cluster and then with feeder um, high schools for us to say, well, which which threads, which concepts um, are are we able to develop throughout our curriculum that, that can then be um, revisited um uh, in in high in in high school, what what are, what are those previous experiences? One of the lovely things we've done as a Penarth cluster is to think about what our um, non-negotiable uh, experiences are for pupils. Um, um, and um, at the start of our process, um, developed a, a sort of Penarth promise or a pledge of the experiences more difficult with COVID, of course, but the experiences that we would give our pupils, uh, which were designed by the pupils themselves, such as um, first aid or um, trips to the theatre. And so um, going to um, children within the Penarth cluster, as an example, going to their various um, high schools had a common um, bank of experiences that they, that, um, that they that we all uh, agreed as as leaders of those schools to um, provide for our pupils and that was a really lovely way of of thinking about how we can have some collective ideas although keeping our um sort of school autonomy at the same time that's a lovely way of considering of dipping the toe into curriculum design isn't it saying the framework isn't giving you everything you need it's not the national curriculum as we've known it it's just a framework but gosh, it gives you these, these key concepts from which then, you know, like you said, if we're looking at democracy, the topic, the actual activity each teacher uses, even within one school can vary. But actually, if they've been exposed to that concept and then they, there's, there's a, a plan there within your non-negotiables across a cluster or even just a school that you know that you're, you're revisiting it, you're deepening your knowledge, the application of the skills around that at each point in the journey, 
um, then, yeah, you know, th that's where your your consistency might come in terms of the consistency of experience and concept, even though the activity level will vary significantly among schools. Yvonne, you, for Salon, you've, you've been exploring that. I think you've always had very strong links with your primary schools. Yeah, I mean, we are very lucky. We, we're a large cluster. We have nine schools and a nursery as well of ourselves in, involved in there. And one of the things that we we have done is kind of develop a mantra of we, we work with what we know and we keep finding out the bits that we don't. So it was important for us that we kept making small steps, no matter how small they were. But we didn't shy away from the things that were concerning us. So, you you know, you mentioned things about the elephant in the room. We have a physical elephant in our in our executive room here because every time there was something that we didn't know the answer to, we put it on the elephant and parked it because we didn't want it to stop us thinking and moving forward, but we didn't have the answer yet. And, and as it went on, we found that we developed more ways of thinking and, you know, those those random bits that you've sort of read something or you've kind of listened to something and then, you know, it comes to you when you're brushing your teeth. We all kind of have those kind of moments in there that the jigsaw starts to fit, but by no means did we ever... We, we had to become OK with the fact that we didn't have the answers, regardless of all the things that we've been exposed to and all the privileges that we'd had in terms of being involved in the process. We were always very mindful of the fact that the quality came in the conversation that we had around the things that we did and didn't know, not because we felt that we knew it all, because by no means I don't think anybody ever does. And I think we had to be OK with that mm -hmm. because that's not necessarily something that comes natural to the profession over the last sort of 20, 30 years. So we have worked very closely. We have, we're very privileged to have a cluster inset day where across all of the staff, we have around between 500 and 50, 600 staff that were involved with, a, with a, an, an annual inset day. And we very much, again, worked on the things that we knew. So when we first started working, we were looking at a cluster response to the LNF. We were looking at a cluster response to the DCF. So we, we worked on the things that we knew to try and develop a shared understanding of that pedagogy of that experience and we kept developing those things as we went along so I have to say that in terms of, of COVID that that has changed the timeline and the things that that we've been exposed to simply because in terms of sort of primary secondary capacity that's very different so you know when when you have a, we've got some small schools that have seven teaching staff well they're teaching they have to be with their children in the middle of what's happened over the last couple of months so their ability to kind of you know free up time and have those discussions we've had to change and adapt to those things and to see what what's important the interesting thing has then come from the professional learning that's been developed where people can listen to something at a different time where they can watch something so it doesn't mean the thinking has stopped and at some point we're quite confident that the groundwork that we've done we will be able to pick it back up again however we're not in a position to keep plowing forward and there are some schools that are we've got um, a smaller group of people that you know they are in a place where they want to work forward and now we're working as being a sort of a in a triad as a critical friend to each other so actually testing what we've done so far testing the vision kind of testing how does it help hold up to the things that we've done so it's still useful so that's a smaller part of working that we'll then be able to share with other people as and when they're ready and they feel they have capacity to bring that back up again so you know it, I think it's important for people to reflect and change the timeline but in terms of thinking about a three to 16 curriculum we were quite mindful as Bev said we weren't driven by the top end in terms of you know qualifications we were having those conversations here about well I'm not changing anything until I see what um, you know what the questions are going to look like and we had to change the mindset of people to realize that we're talking about a child here we're not talking about a particular exam question and you know I think we've all when we were certainly developing language literacy and communication we kept saying our children don't necessarily know how to synthesize information they do know how to answer a synthesis question on the GCSE WJC exam question and those two things are very different so we've had to change the mindset around what those things actually mean so that's had to happen kind of from our end but we also then had to do it in terms of that shared understanding of staff who perhaps hadn't had the experience of teaching in a secondary school and being in that position where you know they've, they've had some difficult conversations around the, the data and you know some of the specifics but perhaps has had experience of the pressure their children, their own children going through the system had had, or seeing kind of, you know, what it means to manage a timetable and revision and, you know, that that part of a, an exam year group. So there were 
all experiences that we needed to be able to bring together. And one of the things that we also had to do was to expose people to those different settings. So we were lucky enough to ensure that we put programs in place, whether it be around languages, around music. We actually, up until COVID, we were providing the PPA cover for the vast majority of our schools, which meant that the, in terms of transition, you know, the children were used to the staff, they were used to those ways of working, but we were sharing the pedagogy across those subject specialisms as well. So those things all became invaluable to us. We also had the luxury of being able to be part of the Welsh Government pilot study around cluster supply teachers. So we had 10 teachers that we were able to deploy across the system and that meant that we had foundation phase specialists we had key stage two specialists as well as secondary specialists but they all had exposure of being able to deliver in all those areas so one of the things that we noticed was that we had to change the mindset of we are developing to a qualification what we actually did was had our teachers go and spend time in a foundation phase classroom and actually realize that you know the children weren't going to hug you and kiss you and all the rest of it that really wasn't what working with little children was we had to kind of overcome some of those challenges we also had to get used to primary staff being comfortable with you know our strapping six footers that, that we've got here as well and and it was just about those experiences as Diane said you know unless you've lived them and been in them you just don't have those opportunities and those things were really important and what we learned from that is that there are fundamental things that develop learning around child development that you know as Bev said they're your drivers then for what you're doing with pedagogy and what you're doing with teaching and learning and once you've got that you stop making it about the outcome at the other end and the outcomes change and then you actually develop an understanding of a purpose-led curriculum and that's not to say that everybody is in that part yet but you can see the light bulbs going off and the other thing that you can see is where we didn't have that opportunity to be with the children and we were working in that blended way for a significant amount of time people have now thought very differently about getting to the essence of learning they're thinking very differently about how they actually develop learning experiences for people so that the learning works it's not about provision i've provided stuff actually what impact is that thing having and how is that developing learning how are we testing the learning if you've got cameras off so it's made people think very differently. And at some point, we will be able to come back together and develop all of those experiences. But we're not concerned that if anybody has that capacity issue at the moment and they just don't have the headspace to do it, that that's going to be to the detriment of any thinking that comes out the other end. Mm. That's really fascinating. I, I love it. I love that pilot project. That mm. that sounds brilliant. And I was really fortunate to have that experience of, of teaching in a through school where it was, you know, you'd go from teaching a year two class straight to, to your strap in year 10s and then maybe you'd be in a, a year three and go on to a year seven. And actually, it was so surprising. I felt that I was so excited, ready for that, having been part of the pioneer process myself that, oh, I, I wanted to educate that whole child in it. But gosh, you've you you can assume that pedagogy is pedagogy and we all use the same or abide by the same sort of principles in pedagogy. But child development, understanding child development is just crucial to because, you know, I certainly found very quickly within my first couple of weeks that the toolkit I'd become accustomed to using as a secondary practitioner for 15 years. Gosh, it was a totally different set of tools. And that surprised me because I had my subject specialism. But but because you've got to understand the developmental stages of, of the children or young people that, that you're teaching. Um, and I, I passionately believe we should all as practitioners spend time across settings, phase ranges, so that we really do. And then if we have created time and space for that to happen, my gosh, how we can collaborate much more purposefully on a three to 16 continuum, because we understand then that, you know, the origins of our subject in terms of embedding that knowledge at, at the earlier stages, how that needs to be sort of filtered in and, and sequenced, everybody is able to thrive. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating speaking with you all. And I know that our schools will really value um, the, the way that you've really honestly and passionately spoken about, about your schools. Considering now, moving forward, that we've got four terms to curriculum for Wales being enacted, um, plus the challenges remaining of, of COVID, plus some of the opportunities of COVID and blended learning. What might your next steps be as schools in terms of your focus towards curriculum for Wales for professional learning? 
well, we're going to keep on um, sort of building that uh, professional learning so that we've got this idea that good teaching is good teaching regardless. And then focus in then on teaching what our pupils need to know. And that's really going back down and thinking at a, uh, at, at a middle leader and a strategic level what it is that our pupils need to know. But then building that idea of the science of learning, that thinking of that interleaving, that spacing, how is that going to look in our curriculum in order that we have that um, learning, that long term change in behaviours and um, knowledge of our pupils. We're going to try to look at using things like Iris Connect so that we're going to we're going to we're going to go down the sort of Matley re, um, route of unseen observations. So that um, every, everybody has is working in a triad or, or with a peer and they get to think of techniques that they are going to, to trial. So we're always focusing on a change in pedagogy, not on the practitioner. So we've got that supportive nature and that high level of trust within the organisation that you are the professional in your classroom so that they get to talk. They get, you've got the planning, you've got the enactment with 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 actually doing um the, the, the technique and looking at to see the impact of it and then that reflection and that refinement. So and then what we've got then in all our um, for, for our for our meeting structure now, we've we've radically changed that. And basically it is more more or less all um, professional learning happens within a context. So you're with your AOLE or you're with your department in order for all your training. So when you are thinking of um, what does cold calling look like, it is what cold calling looks like in science, in PE, in history, in geography. So it's very much context led. And I think that is that idea of that powerful professional learning because it's what is relevant for you. We're also giving um, that autonomy to our um, subject leaders to really develop their curriculum. But we're having line management uh, meetings with senior leaders far more often on a two week basis so that we can be really adaptive um, and, um, and very quick in um, acting on any barriers to learning that could happen. So it's that idea of that support plus the challenge in order to, to get the curriculum right for our children, get the pedagogy uh, right within the classroom on every level, and then the support there in order to make sure that nobody feels stressed and it becomes um, ha ha habitual. It isn't something that is going to be something that's an add-on, oh, today I'm going to do cold calling. calling. It is, I do cold calling in order that I that I'm checking for understanding that I'm doing retrieval practice. So it's 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 very much now taking the cognitive load down for the teacher, but then still improving um, the learning journey journey and the progression of our pupils. That's fab. Thanks, Bev. Uh, Laura, what about you? What would your your next steps be? We're looking at um, some of the more granular elements of the curriculum at the moment. So particularly based on the children's experiences through lockdown and our uh, newly adapted vision, I suppose, to ensure that uh, whilst they're in school with us, that they have um, uh, a, a broad range of outdoor learning, physical development, continuous enhanced provision. And um, so we're looking at, like I said, those granular elements of that and how we can ensure that um, those parts of our curriculum uh, are also progressive and coherent uh, as the sort of overview of the curriculum is. And we're also looking at the way um, our pupils uh, can apply the knowledge and skills and experiences that they've been doing. So we have part of our domain structure that's called um, an application we can exit celebration. Uh, and we're looking at the ways we can use and develop uh, the integral skills more. So creativity and problem solving, et cetera, um, to uh, enhance the curriculum even more. Mm. Oh, fab, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Diane, what about you and Tiguin? Um, I think this next term, what we have said that we're going to do is to give the um, the AOLEs um, out. The, so the curriculum documentation, our, our um, admin staff at the moment are distributing. So to give them time, they have to still have their twilight sessions and training days. So they'll have the time now to go back because this last year has been very 
um, driven by lots and lots of different initiatives and um, contact with parents. And we've got all the children back at the moment, apart from those children that are still shielding. So um, it is it is as uh, we were just saying, really, to make sure that their contacts are interesting, given that um, I can't envisage that they're going to be going on school trips. Their environment will be very local. So it's to make sure that they, they still have interest in things. We have whole school events. Um, we did have a whole school event when we were looking at that initially, and we had the teams of people around AOLEs, and we almost had a, a whole day of they brought out lots of different examples and activities they've done, and people could do around Robin to get um, ideas from each other, and they do that in our morning meetings as well. We have um, early meetings, whole school meetings, and they had um, as you say, things that were happening in the nursery for innovation where they were doing something around St. David's Day and they did the great sensory activity. And then some of our teachers that were in Key Stage 4 said, that would be great, I could do that, I could just adapt everything and we could. Um, so they're, they're linking things like that, but actually it'll be around this, those getting back to give those children the experiences they've missed by not being in school up till now. But for our, our staff, as well as um, still the inquiry, it's given them the opportunity this time to, to look at the to look now at the documentation again and then to sort of so we can reset then to uh, to start doing the AOLE development. Mm. Oh, thanks Diane that's great. And Yvonne? Yeah, for us it's, it's kind of a focus now on, on sort of depth and equity so one of the things that we've probably discovered over the last 12 months is that you know for, for us this is really important to get this right we we know that there is a difference in 20 year lifespan for what for our children in terms of one area of the catchment area to the other and it's it's made us aware as you said of m many more um connections in terms of our communities and i and i mean that in the most plural way because i think there's a danger that we kind of see our school community as an homogenous group and that and that's quite often not the case so for us it's about making sure that that level of understanding is is there across the piece i i'm you know, we're, we're wary of the facts of things like challenging misconceptions that might have appeared in the system with people's having different different perceptions of what's going on. So, you know, for example, things like a blend of approaches as a pedagogical principle is not the same as blended learning. The, the expectation is not to stick a computer in front of everybody forever. So there's all of those things in terms of depth. And I think that comes from a, a careful evaluation process that we're now going through to be able to think about what do we want to keep that's been really valuable and the things that it's also challenged about what we did before that perhaps not is is as relevant as what they now are but all of those things being moving forward towards that that why that purpose driven curriculum of what we want to do so with that then that enables that focus on curriculum design and we really want everybody to be in a in a, in a really good position to understand the concept of curriculum design and to know what that looks like in terms of a um, you know, a pedagogical approach as well as a practical approach to really uh, underpick that. And, and in the same way as what Bev said, you know, I think that those subject specialisms are really strong. So what we are developing is um, in a similar fashion, really, that idea of curriculum as the progression model. And if curriculum is the progression model, you need to really understand curriculum and you need to understand that from a subject specialism point of view. And that's what I mean by equity. How it's developed in terms of areas of learning in maths and numeracy is going to be different in humanities, is going to be different in health and well-being. And it's not about things about structuring timetables and making sure everybody has equal time and, you know, and, and you know, equal numbers of departments and staff members and all of those things. But it is about, you know, as, as Bev articulated earlier, how those things are contributing to the whole. So for us, it's about taking the time to really think about what subject specialisms mean inside areas of learning across areas of learning the way in which we've approached that is kind of like this idea of, of home and away so what we've got our departments working on at the moment is what is it that is their knowledge their skills their experiences that is absolutely fundamental to the the discipline in which they they actually perform with, with their children and therefore they will be the best people to do that delivery the other part of that then is the away ideas about which bits that are are kind of done by other people where subject specialisms exist in some other areas of the school that is going to better enhance that and then that allows the conversation then about sequencing do we do things at the same time do we do things one after another that sort of spaced and interleaving practice about where they occur and that's the thing that we really want to focus on because that was a big focus for a, a, an inset day that we had planned in the summer that 
we we don't want the screen to be the barrier for the thinking because we have to do it in this way so we're thinking about different ways in which we do that so that we can have the equivalent of having massive pieces of paper on a massive wall that people can contribute to and the physicality of actually making those decisions as you, as you do them so for us it is about making sure that that depth is re- is really there um that we haven't kind of developed any misconceptions that we haven't kind of developed any assumptions that we are all, all working in the same area to ensure that what we actually have is an equitable curriculum that means that everybody is having access and the provision that they need so that regardless of what their experience has been over the last 12 months or you know longer than that they get what they need to move forward and to achieve the full purposes mm-hmm. So a huge thanks to the four of you for for giving up uh, your time today. And we hope that we'll catch up with you in another podcast at some point shortly. Thanks all. Diolch am rando ar y bennod hon o sgwrs. Cofiwch ein dilyn ar Twitter a Facebook, tan ysgrifio ein sianel YouTube, a mino yn cymunedau ar ein gwefan a darllen ein bulletin ysgolion athnosol am y newyddion diwedd araf. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sgwrs. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, join our online communities via our website and read our weekly school bulletin for the latest news. Hoyla Metro. Bye for now.